Is not all of philosophy as if written in honey? Albert Einstein once remarked. It looks wonderful when one contemplates it. But when one looks again, it's all gone. Only mush remains. Did he know what he was talking about? Well, in Subtle is the Lord, his wonderful biography of Einstein, Abraham Pace claims twice that Einstein studied philosophical writings throughout his life, beginning in his high school days when he first read Kant. Science without epistemology, Pace quotes Einstein as saying, is, insofar as it is thinking at all, primitive and muddled. When Einstein went on to say which particular epistemology is needed to rescue science from a primitive muddle, his answer seems to have been all of them. The scientist, Einstein declared, must appear to the systematic epistemologist as a type of unscrupulous opportunist. He goes on, he appears as a realist insofar as he seeks to describe a world independent of the acts of perception. An idealist insofar as he looks upon the concepts and theories of, as the free inventions of the human spirit. As a positivist insofar as he considers his concepts and theories justified only to the extent to which they furnish a logical representation of relations among sensory experiences. He may even appear as a Platonist or Pythagorean insofar as he considers the viewpoint of logical simplicity as an indispensable and effective tool of his research. As evidence of Einstein's supposed lifelong interest in philosophy, this is fairly un unconvincing and tends rather to lend weight to Pice's own somewhat dismissive and occasionally even disapproving attitude to the impact of philosophy on Einstein's thinking. Calling Einstein a philosopher, Pice remarks, sheds as much light on him as calling him a musician. It's a remark that could go either way, of course, but it is, I think, pretty clear which direction Pice wants it to go. One is reminded of Frederick Raphael's quip, Einstein was great, and he played the violin, but that does not make him a great violinist. Dropping metaphor for plain speech, Pice declares, there can be as little doubt that philosophy stretched Einstein's personality, as that his philosophical knowledge played no direct role in his major creative efforts. The only serious role that Price acknowledges Einstein's philosophical commitments to have had on his physics is one that he considers to have been disastrous. Einstein's objections to quantum physics, Price maintains, were at bottom driven by philosophical commitments, and all the worse for that. Whether we agree or disagree with Price about that, we keep coming up against a basic lack of evidence about what form exactly Einstein's interest in philosophy took. Though he has evidently taken a special interest in this area of Einstein's intellectual life, Pice can offer only inconclusive and sporadic information about Einstein's interest in and knowledge of philosophy. For example, that he read Kant as a schoolboy, that with his friends in Bern, he studied Spinoza's ethics, Hume's treatise, and Mill's logic, that he was familiar with Bertrand Russell's theory of knowledge, and that among the Oriental philosophers, he appreciated Confucius. Once in Princeton, Pice adds, Einstein fell asleep during a lecture on Zen Buddhism. But he goes on, perhaps he was tired that evening. More or less the only evidence of a sustained interest in actually discussing philosophy that Pice can offer is contained in his rather laconic sentence, quote, in 1943, Einstein, Gödel, Bertrand Russell and Pauli gathered at Einstein's home to discuss philosophy of science about half a dozen times. The source for this is Russell's own autobiography, where these discussions are described as follows. The latter part of our time in America was spent at Princeton, where we had a little house on the shores of the lake. While in Princeton, I came to know Einstein fairly well. I used to go to his house once a week to discuss with him and Gödel and Pauli. These discussions were in some ways disappointing, for although all three of them were Jews and exiles, and in intention cosmopolitan, I found that they all had a German bias towards metaphysics. And in spite of our utmost endeavors, we never arrived at common premises from which to argue. Gödel turned out to be an unadulterated Platonist, and apparently believed that an eternal knot was laid up in heaven, where virtuous logicians might hope to meet it hereafter. 
End of quote. Soon after Russell's death, this passage was drawn to Girdle's attention by Kenneth Blackwell, the Russell archivist at McMaster University, who naturally wanted to know more about these discussions. Somewhat uncharacteristically, Girdle did actually bother to reply to Blackwell. Entirely characteristically, however, he never posted his reply. <laughs> and it was not discovered until after his death. In it, he drew attention to some inaccuracies in Russell's account. First, he said, not that it matters, he stressed, he was not, in fact, Jewish. Second, the impression given by Russell that they had several meetings was, he thought, false. He could remember only one. Finally, Girdle wrote, concerning my unadulterated Platonism, it is no more unadulterated than Russell's own in 1921, when in the introduction to mathematical philosophy, he said, logic is concerned with the real world just as truly as zoology though with its more abstract and general features. At that time, evidently, Russell had met them not even in this world. But later, under the influence of Wittgenstein, he chose to overlook it. Gödel's reply to Blackwell makes one wonder what might have happened if Einstein had met Russell not in 1943, but in 1905, a year that has gone down in intellectual history, not only as the year in which Einstein's theory of relativity was first published, but also as the year in which Russell published his seminal contribution to thought on denoting, an article which, while not as widely known to the general public as that in which Einstein first introduced M equals MC, E equals MC squared, is, among analytic philosophers, every bit as canonical. This year, for every international conference of scientists and historians of science celebrating 100 years of relativity, there is an international conference of philosophers and historians of philosophy celebrating the centenary of on denoting. A meeting between Einstein and Russell in 1905 would have been a very different event to that which took place in Princeton in 1943. For then Russell himself would have been steeped in the German bias towards metaphysics that he attributes to Einstein, Pauli and Gödel. And as Gödel says, the particular metaphysics in which he would have been steeped was a Platonism every bit as unadulterated as Gödel's own. 